Thank you so much for coming today. Welcome to uh, Fashion Talks at AUP between consumption, criticism and activism tonight with Kim Howe on the power of inclusivity and self-expression in the fashion industry. We're really thrilled to have you here tonight for our first in-person fashion talk um, for the last year and a half. And um, Kim is the co-founder and creative director of About the Worker, which started as a graduation project for the Design Academy of Eindhoven. And together with Paul Boulanger, she began to build About the Worker as a practical and social and creative system in 2017. And she's going to talk about their work. About a Work is, is really then a design studio, giving workers from around the world the possibility to speak out by becoming designers while valuing their crafts and creative talents. And uh, when I first met um, Kim and her work, um, I was immediately very impressed by the way the hierarchies in the fashion industries are challenged and really deconstructed and then reworked in a very practical manner, but also very humane and inclusive and loving manner in a way. So um, I think it's a form of applied activism that you do. And in that, you really fit very well into our lecture series this year. And I'm really looking forward to your talk. A warm welcome and over to you. Good evening, everyone. I think this is... Okay, that's good. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for welcoming me. Uh, so my name is Kim Wu, and I'm the founder of About a Worker. And it's a project that I started in 2017 in order for the workers to have a voice in the fashion industry. So today, the fashion world looks a little bit like this. Uh, so I think we're all admiring fashion for the way we can like acquire clothes that can make us feel beautiful or where we can actually express ourselves. But the question is, are we actually expressing ourselves as well? Uh, because I, I feel that uh, we've been uh, tracked by a system that we've uh, that has influenced us um, to believe in uh, some ideas. So for example, with commercials, like commercial works and advertising in fashion, um, we've learned to love luxury and try to have a, and acquire a luxurious lifestyle. And uh, as consumers who don't always have the wallet for it, uh, they've, uh, th th we've been like tr striving to get uh, the cheaper ver version than like what we can see in the runway shows, but in order to feel beautiful and feel accepted in a crowd as well. But when we look at the media and when we look at how um, we've been sort of shaped by the fashion system, it seems that uh, we, like the, the fashion cultures, tend to drive us towards a hierarchical system. When we look at the Devil Wars Prada, for example, instead of being disgusted by the fashion world, we tend to actually kind of like it as well and kind of like the perversity behind it. Uh, we kind of all want to be a Miranda, for example. Um, or we kind of all want to succeed like Karl Lagerfeld did by kind of becoming dominant towards others as well. What happened is that over these last decades, um, we've kind of followed this hierarchical path where the elite, the one who have the power and the money and the influence has given orders to others without really knowing them, but we tend to execute uh, what the elite, the power, the power uh, bubble tells us to do. As a result, we have consumers feeling that they always need uh, to uh, acquire new clothes to feel beautiful. Um, designers, except the superstars, uh, tend to have to uh, cope with the fashion tendencies as well. And the workers behind them, well, we don't really know them, but it's okay not to really care about their well-being because they are just the one producing our clothes. But 
you know, it's okay not to pay them that much and to you to actually use a kind of like slavery system. Um, it seems that this hierarchical system actually has not only been going on for decades, but since the beginning of the industrial era, and it seems that it's still a tendency of uh, slavery as well. Um, we tend to go towards far away countries where you have people in social difficulties uh, and in economic difficulties as well. And we tend to like, yeah, take uh, advantage of them in some ways to produce more clothes. So over these last years, especially uh, after the Rana Plaza event, which happened um, like in 2014, uh, it seems that uh, we've been the media have started to really shake up the world about like the ethical issues going on in the fashion industry. Not only the ethical issues, but also the global warming issues, because fashion is the second most polluting industry in the world. Um, but there are things going on. There are like uh, innovation going on towards a better system. But it seems that we still. Uh, use this sort of slavery system as well. Um, during the COVID time, we saw that most of the bigger brands such as H&M, Zara, um, and others have like canceled on their orders, uh, canceled their orders. Uh, so a lot of people all around Asia lost their job, especially for example in Bangladesh, where millions of workers have lost their job from one day to the other, even if their salary was already low, like that time, like they had no more jobs. So a lot of the the, the population out there, um, like really were left out with nothing. And sometimes the only way to be able to survive is also through prostitution. So, which is a, a huge issue. Um, and uh, for example, we heard recently about uh, the, the Uyghur crisis in China where it's totally all right and totally okay not to pay workers for their job and to actually force labor uh, towards a, a minority as well. So I think we are also at an interesting time where a lot of designers and a lot of system makers and entrepreneurs are trying to find out new system of production and creation uh, for more sustainable industry. As a student, uh, when I was a student at the Design Academy of Eindhoven, I focused on finding out new communication and production system, um, like through different projects, through closings, through some fake advertising, through trying to collaborate with also other students in order to co-create close together. But I realized something is that we cannot really uh, find out uh, um, uh, a system which can truly function if we don't communicate with absolutely all the actors of the fashion industry, whether we are consumers, designers, part of the fashion elite, or especially workers, uh, the workers that we don't hear. And if we don't get together and try to find out the solution, we'll never know the problematics of each uh, bubble as well. So, uh, as I saw in my design studies, um, and I, I, as I considered after all my studies, I realized that uh, design can actually become a universal language. The problem about our industry is that it's so globalized that it's really hard to be able to talk to these different actors because everyone speaks a different language too. But design, art, architecture, uh, have this, this power to actually uh, um, showcase emotions and, uh, and uh, a vision and also um, uh, can, can become a source of discussion. It's been used in design and art and fashion have been used in the past also to promote ideas, as we can see, for example, with propaganda from Russia here. Uh, but it has also been a way to actually uh, debate on an idea. Um, on the right side, uh, you can see uh, an exhibition which happened recently at the Tate Modern in London, where everyone was able to draw freely in the, the, the hall of the Tate Modern. 
and uh, express themselves through it. And I think this is a really nice piece because it's a conversation piece where everyone creates an artwork together, but also express some ideas together too. So about a worker was actually born uh, during my studies in 2016 at the beginning. And I actually had this idea for a long time. Uh, like I think it took me three years before actually developing it, but I was talking about it to my teachers and about the idea of uh, giving workers the possibility to become designers. And a lot of them were thinking, but Kim, like, how are you gonna do this? Uh, workers are not artists, they are not designer. Um, why would they take our jobs also? And uh, the first idea was to go to China and uh, train uh, sweatshop workers from China to become designers. And a lot of my teachers told me, oh, but you know, they don't really have any imagination and, uh, and creativity as they don't have the freedom to speak up as well. So it's funny because from a teacher's side point of view, like you, you can actually tell that they are scared of this idea, but also they are scared of the idea of including a minority um, inside of uh, the, the fashion system too. But yeah, I was rebellious enough. So I decided to, after a couple of years, to actually create it as my graduation project. And fortunately, uh, my main teacher was like, okay, like, but let's try it and we'll see if it works or not. <laughs> Um, so the first collection uh, happened in Saint-Denis in uh, an integration factory, which is called uh, Modestime. And uh, it's, uh, it's a clothing factory, but where they only hired people in social and physical difficulties. And uh, we had the chance to work with five of their best workers um, who all came from immigration and who all had different background, which brought them to the fashion industry. Um, so in order to give them the possibilities to become designers, we didn't ask them to just design clothes like this. We actually um, created a design initiation, which is an initiation with different exercises inspired by the way you create a fashion collection. So going from a mood board to an end product, passing by fabric sample, textures, illustration, etc but where in each task uh, they were asked to actually express themselves and express um, uh, their, their inner stories as well. I'm gonna show you right now a small movie, um, which is, hmm. here, okay. Je vais toujours raconter à mes enfants. J'ai dit la première 
fois que j'ai commencé à tricoter, imagine, il me dit que j'ai du désert. C'est quoi J'ai dit, c'est des épées. C'est pas vrai. Je ne compte pas avec des épées, mais j'ai dit, si, je vais faire avec des épées. Il y a un bac pro, un côté pro, un côté là, travailler dans un usine, un côté usine, après que je m'en dis non. C'était un peu super, tout par organisé. C'était travail à la chaîne. On fait presque 45 heures par semaine. On travaille de lundi jusqu'à samedi. On arrivait de travailler la nuit. On arrivait de travailler une soirée de fête. Et on est, on est devenu comme un, des machines. Une fois en France aussi, je faisais des petits euh, travaux. Euh, Tant que femme de ménage, femme de chambre. Je trouve pas de, il n'y a pas de grandes boîtes ici, que des petites euh, voilà, ateliers. Je suis arrivée en France bah, avec ma femme et des enfants. On a trois enfants, même le premier né, il est au coma. La vie, elle était compliquée. Mais euh, maintenant, c'était euh, plus facile. Et voilà, après, euh, je suis devenue à modestie. J'ai trouvé ça génial. J'étais contente. Premièrement, de trouver un travail dans ce que je j'aime. Alors, ça a été vraiment pour moi une grande joie. On a beaucoup de matériel très important. On a des machines simples, on des serviteurs. La première journée, c'était un peu compliqué. Parce que quand je suis arrivée, on m'avait dit bien que euh, ici, je vais travailler avec des femmes. Et puis, euh, je suis arrivée, euh, on a créé avec elles. Maintenant, je me sens comme je travaille avec des hommes. Depuis que je suis là, j'ai suis senti euh, utile quoi. Donc euh, je sais que je peux faire quelque chose et je peux apporter quelque chose aux, aux autres. C'est pour ça que j'aime bien la couture et c'est surtout ça quoi. J'aimerais bien aussi un jour de créer un monde dans ce monde aussi. Pour voir si je peux y arriver. Ça sera un nouvel monde. Les gens ils vont rigoler, mais ça sera sympa aussi. Ma vie, ça c'est la vérité. J'ai que la tristesse là, dans mon cerveau. Ce qui m'a arrivé, ce n'était pas si facile. Et puis c'est le souvenir que j'ai gardé dans mes mois. Mais euh, au travail, je la lève, je vais baisser sur la tête. Dès que je sors là, je l'ai mis dans ma tête. Pour aller chez moi. L'amour n'est ni moral, ni amoral, ni elle est. Faites pour remonter le moral. Okay, so as you see, this is um kind of the way we work with workers. So we go inside factories and uh, and we, co we collaborate with them creatively, but also uh, what's really nice is that we have this one-on-one -on -one conversations going on constantly with them as well. And I think that's the nicest thing about yeah, the work we've been doing since the beginning is that uh, we have this closeness going on and what we hope for in the fashion world is that this closeness could happen within other companies too. Um, so after this initiation, uh, they this initiation where they went through so many steps, we asked them to create uh, some first prototypes by deconstructing and reconstructing blue overall. So the blue overall is the symbol of the French factory worker. And uh, we asked them to express uh, throughout the process and also through this clothes uh, their stories and uh, how they arrived in France as well. And uh, what was interesting is that for them, it was the first time that they felt integrated. Uh, in France, there is a huge problem of segregation. I don't know if you've heard of it or you've seen it, but as you can see, like there is a lot of suburbs where, which are a little bit ghettoized, to be honest. And this, and uh, the yes, like Paris is a really mixed city, but it seems that uh, people stay within their own little bubbles as well. So in order to expose these clothes and glorify those clothes as well, um, we didn't only stop by, we didn't stop by just like um, creating clothes. We actually exposed these clothes in different contexts. 
the first one was through a performance where we ask models uh, to wear the clothes of the that the workers made, but also to um, learn a couple of sentences from their first interview that they did with us. And whenever someone would approach the clothes, um, the the model. Uh, who wasn't on your coat hanger, uh, would actually express uh, one of the sentences uh, of the worker who made and designed uh, the piece of clothes. Um, and then we also created an installation, an immersive installation, where people could actually discover by themselves uh, the process behind the collection. So there was like all of the pictures that the workers took, uh, the illustration, the first samples that they did, etc. And they could also sit uh, at the working tables of the worker and discover their interviews. And finally, we were also invited to uh, to Les Beaux Arts de Paris for an exhibition uh, cele celebrating May 68, uh, and uh, we invited the workers to actually become teacher uh, teacher at Les Beaux Arts de Paris and uh, teach their craft uh, to the audience of uh, of the um, of the exhibition. And what was interesting about this process is that. Um, yeah, there was this close proximity going on, but also it was a way to also glorify the workers uh, in an in in a art context as well. And then after this collection, we went to Venezia, to Venice in Italy, uh, but not in um, not in a typical craftsman uh, little uh, workshop, as you would think so, but inside of a carceral center, so it was a prison. It was a prison for women situated in the Judeca, so just in front of San Marco. And uh, there was a couture workshop inside of this prison where uh, some prisoners were actually making uh, a costume for carnival, but also had a small little brand on the side called Loaded Zero, where they would produce clothes with uh, leftover fabric from uh, Venetian weavers. And we had the chance to collaborate with four women uh, who were all incarcerated, but who all had really interesting personalities too. And we wanted to actually take this opportunity for them to find back their values. What we realized when we arrived in prison uh, is that a lot of the, those women are considered our prisoners and they kind of lose their sense of, um, of their personal values and their personal identity. And uh, most of the time they feel that they're like everyone, bad persons. And, uh, and so we wanted to actually use the initiation as a sort of therapeutical experience so we as we first asked them to create a mask so mask is of course a reference to venus also for the mask carnival but it's also a way to express yourself it could be for hiding yourself but it's also uh, a way to express yourself in a in a bigger way as well that you could do with your own face and so we asked them to create masks on different supports, so first going from drawings to painting to also fabric, uh, to also create fabric masks. And at the end, they created on the lace maker outfit from Burano uh, some kind of avatar, as you can see on the right, uh, on the right side, uh, where uh, they really showcase a sort of um, identity of their own, which is more than just a person, it's a, a kind of creator that represents them. And this is a collection that they made. And um, something I forgot to mention is uh, that we were sponsored by a weaving house called Rubelli, which is a, a weaving house from Venice. So all of the pieces were unique because they were all using different uh, uh, weaving uh, material, uh, woven material from Rubelli as well. Uh, this is how we showcase the work. So we showed it in Venice during the Venice Biennale for the exhibition Venice Design, which happened at Palazzo Michel, uh, where we exposed the first prototypes just after they were made. What was really cool is that the prisoners actually were invited to come to the exhibition and came to the exhibition to see the work, which was a first as well and a way to uh, kind of leave the prison for a day. Uh, and then we also exposed a collection in Paris at uh, EP7, which is this really cool cultural center uh, specialized in uh, 3D and virtual media. 
and on the facade, uh, we we showcase um, the the process of the workers uh, on the facade, but also like the sentences that they said during the first interview. Uh, we also invited uh, some uh, some uh, uh, singer and dancer specialized in the Comedia dell'arte, which is really like this uh, theater regis reg register uh, from uh, from Venice uh, about expression, about how to you can express yourself through movement and through uh, phrase uh, sentences, and uh, and they. Uh, they, uh, the, the singer were asked to actually um, reinterpret the writings of the, the prisoners uh, through singing. After these two collections, we had our first big collaboration with a big brand from France, which is called La Redoute. I would say it's kind of like the ASOS uh, in the UK, for example. Uh, it's really famous, it's been famous since uh, the 70s because it was the first m kind of like shop that you had in a book. So we would send you uh, by mail post, a, uh, like a ma kind of magazine with like different, uh, different clothes and you would choose them on uh, the magazine. And what's really interesting is that since the 70s, uh, they've been inviting designers such as Yves Saint Laurent, such as Karl Lagerfeld, such as Yamamoto, to create collaborations uh, for for cheaper for like uh, their clients, and uh, and recently they started inviting a younger designer. There was Jacques Mus, there was Cochet recently, and they invited us. So that was really cool, <laughs> um, and we had the chance to collaborate with kind of different sort of workers, well, not garment workers, but logistic workers. Uh, so logistic workers are people who pack up clothes every day. And as you see here, that was uh, the workspace where the, the participants were working every day. Um, and it's like this huge uh, warehouse with no, not really any window, which is really cold. And also which is a little bit strange because machines are becoming more important than human than human inside of uh, this uh, th this big warehouse, and so uh, the big problematic that the workers have is what are we here for? Because most of the time they do super monotonous uh, work, but their job keep getting taken by robots as well. Um, and so, yeah, unfortunately, unfor uh, they are trying to, La Redoute is trying to actually uh, empower their workers a bit more than in the past and also uh, give them the possibility to grow. And I think that's a wonderful initiative from them because they know that, of course, we're in a fashion world where everything needs to go fast and robots are faster than humans today. But... Um, the, the fact that they asked us to collaborate with certain of their workers is amazing because it seems that the company will grow in a more human manner as well, where you take human dignity on a higher level than expected. And so we collaborated with a group of, uh, of six workers who, for the first time, were collaborating on the collection collectively. So this is the first time that uh, we did this time. Most of the time it was one outfit per, per worker. And we asked them to uh, reinterpret uh, their personal uniform, which was a yellow jacket. And that happened before the yellow jacket movement. So it was a little bit uh, strange. And you will see that the collection has changed after the, the movement because we couldn't um, use yellow as a color. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, But yeah, so at the beginning, we gave them all a sort of notebook where they had to write down their thoughts about their uniform, but also kind of transform it. And then we uh, recreated this exercise collectively, collectively uh, between the workers, the pattern makers, but also the creative directors. And what's really interesting is that most of the workers have 30 years of experience at Tarodout and have been working in this logistics center for more than 30 years sometimes, but they had never met the creative director, the pattern makers before. And that was the first time that they actually got to gather with them and discover another side of La Redoute that they had no idea about. So we created some pieces which were at the beginning functional. Uh, we, we mainly asked them actually to make their clothes more comfortable. But what 
actually came up is that what they wanted wasn't comfort, but to feel as elegant as their bosses. And so we created a collection by getting inspired uh, by uh, the functionality of their clothes, but also by a way how they could feel uh, better within their company. And sometimes it was by copying the tuxedos and the costumes of, uh, of uh, their superior. So this is the collection. And as you see, um, for most of our uh, photo shoot, we always ask the workers to also become models because models are value, so why not workers too? Uh, so th then we we also invited the workers to come to Paris because the um, I forgot to say but the factory was situated in Roubaix uh, in the north of France. It's uh, this region which used to be one of the most important region for the fashion industry in France, but. Uh, a couple of decades ago, it completely got um, g got kind of destroyed because uh, because of the globalization and uh, a lot. Before you used to have a lot of different factories, but now they are mainly logistics center and a couple of companies too. Um, so we did an exhibition there uh, at uh, in Roubaix uh, uh, just before the one in the, the exhibition in Paris. Uh, so, because we wanted the workers to bring their family to uh, to to see the clothes and the collection, but also we invited all the workers to come to pa Paris and um, and talk at Lafayette Anticipation, and uh, we had a debate about the future of fashion uh, between dr fashion journalists, creati the creative director of La Redoute, and La Redoute workers too, and it was really interesting because it really became. La Fayette Anticipation became for one night a platform to reimagine the fashion world differently. And then after La Redoute, we made one of our biggest dreams happen, uh, which was to actually collaborate with sweatshop workers in China. Um, our goal is, of course, uh, to transform the industry into an ethical platform, but at the same time, if we don't understand what's going on within the sweatshop industry, we won't be able to have a clue on how to create an inclusive system for tomorrow. And we were in actually invited by uh, the Biennial of Urbanism and Architecture in Shenzhen in 2019, just before the COVID crisis happened. Um, and we had the chance to uh, live for a couple of weeks and uh, collaborate with uh, five workers from Bao An, which is a workers' village situated uh, next to Shenzhen. Uh, and what's really interesting about Shenzhen is that a couple of years ago, it was a small industrial city uh, or even a village in itself. But over, um, over this last decade, it really expanded and it became one of the biggest megalopolis in China. And uh, what was interesting is that uh, the exhibition happened so in the village of Bao An, but it was supposed to get demolished after the exhibition. But so many workers actually continue to work there and uh, have their home, but which are about to get destroyed because of uh, the uh, gentrification which is going on. And so we took this opportunity to actually ask the workers um, how did they uh, how did they perceive Shenzhen in the past and how did it transform today? Uh, a lot of them actually came from rural areas. Um, so most of the workers in China actually come to the big city to find work. And usually uh, the, the first job that they get are in factories. And so uh, the women we worked with uh, actually were licensed from their factories and were working from home for different companies. Um, but they used to work in sweatshops before. And yeah, all of them were extremely worried about what will happen to them a couple of months after the exhibition. Uh, one of the first questions we asked them during the interview was, what's your dream? And a lot, most of them uh, we responded, I want to have a roof like in a couple of uh, months, and I'm not even sure I will be able to get it. And I don't even know where I'm going to go because uh, after the village is destroyed, I have no idea where to go because Shenzhen has become so expensive over time. 
Uh, so uh, as for the other collection, we asked them to take pictures of structures and textures of Shenzhen uh, and and uh, deconstruct some uniform to recreate patterns and embellish the, the uniforms. Um, and what was really interesting about this collection is that actually it was the first time that we saw that some workers who were actually helping themselves to create the collection on time. So the process was a 10 days process, which was quite short, um, but they all helped each other to make the, the collection cohesive and uh, to make the outfit response to each other's too. So these are a couple of pictures uh, from the collection. You can see more of them on our website. Um, and yes, this is the exhibition. So after the after we made the, the collection, so the, the whole process, by the way, happened uh, during the building of the exhibition. So when uh, it happened on site, uh, on the building site of the exhibition, uh, they built an exhibition in 10 days, which is insane. When I say uh, uh, they built an exhibition, it's also the building that they built, which is crazy. Um, Welcome to China. Everything goes fast, <laughs> um, and um, and yes, uh, so everything happened like on the site of the exhibition, and so then what was really cool is that the public could actually discover the whole factory uh, of uh, that we used during the, ex the during the process. Uh, as you see, like uh, on the the facade of the the building, there is a huge sign saying about the worker Shenzhen collection. Uh, the thing which is quite annoying with China is that uh, you have a lot of censorship. And at the beginning, we were supposed to put sentences from the workers, but they said no. And the only thing that we could do was to put our logo on. But yeah, at least it says about the worker. <laughs> Uh, finally, I'm going to introduce you to our last collection that we did with the last slipper company in France. So in France, you'll have this uh, really grandpa-ish shoe, which is called the Charentaise. And it's this really traditional shoe, which has been copied all around the world, actually. Um, and the factory that you see here was supposed to close down two years ago. And uh, finally, they rebuilt it. Uh, it's a company which is owned by, um, by a family house called Rondino, uh, which has been existing since 1857. And yeah, uh, two years ago, they were supposed to close it. But finally, they decided to reopen a new one. And what uh, was their problematic is how to kind of maintain tradition while moving forwards uh, towards the future. And uh, we were super happy actually to work with them and we couldn't have made this project happen if uh, we weren't supported by, um, by, um, by a foundation called um, uh, Entre uh, Fondation d'Entreprise Martel. And it's a foundation situated in, an art foundation situated in Cognac, uh, which, uh, uh, gives artists the possibility to collaborate with local uh, craftsmen. And uh, and so, yeah, we made this collection uh, with the the four of the last 16 artisans uh, of uh, L'Atelier of uh, Latelier Charentaise. And um, the idea was actually to reinterpret the tartan fabric. So tartan is really like the fabric which has been used since the 70s for Charentaise and which has created the success of the Chantez, but also the failing of the Chantez, because after uh, the, um, the company uh, launched this product, so many countries and companies all over the world have copied these shoes. And so we asked the workers to reimagine some new patterns by getting inspired by their enterprise. And as you can see, these are the shoes which are currently available on our website as well <laughs> for pre-order. And um, so for the shoes, they um, they got inspired by um, by the tools that they have on site. Uh, so as you see, for example, on the left side, the blue shoes uh, have like a lot of T's, but actually the T's is to represent the key that you can see here. And um, 
and yeah, and then there were the the one on the in the middle is an interpretation, a new interpretation of a uh, of a uh, of a tartan, and the the third one is a tartan, but kind of reimagined also through uh, the mix of uh, of two felt fabric. Uh, most of the time, charentaises uh, are uh, use uh, woven fabric or printed fabric to create their shoes. But uh, now we tried through uh, the process to actually invent some sort of textures and some ways to innovate through through textures, through chantes. Uh, we also um, work a lot with different young public because for us, one of our main interests is also to um, give the young public, the, the young consumers, the ability to actually change their system and change the system we are in. So we were invited for an exhibition called uh, uh, Lead World Design Capital, so that was um, also last year. And um, we collaborated with a young association called Anti Fashion, and uh, they it's an association which gives um, to people, to young people living in the suburbs of uh, Roubaix, the possibility to actually discover the fashion world and gain a fashion education for free. We all know that like. Uh, fashion school is at least 20,000 euros per year and this is like a free education but it's also a way for the, um, the the particularity of this program is actually for the students to actually collaborate with different kind of um, of uh, enterprises in fashion so they've been they have collaborated with different designers but they have also collaborated uh they have also learned how to become workers within uh some factories also from around um and now so the the people we worked with were part of anti fashion and were also uh, workers young workers for um uh, this company called projet resilience which is a f closing factory which opened uh, during the covid crisis and so for this project, we asked uh, the, 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 these young people to actually create their own initiation. Uh, so as you see on the, the big picture, there are lots of aprons here, like blue aprons. And uh, the public of the exhibition could get one for free. And uh, he could design it with one of the workers who was on site uh, as he wanted to. So he could uh, say, OK, I want a flower, I want this, I want that. And the workers will make it uh, on site for him. And so this is, for example, on the right, uh, one of the apron that uh, one of the, 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 the member of the audience of, uh, of the exhibition uh, created with one of the workers. This is a, a project that we did uh, in Prato. Uh, Prato is a city in Italy near Florence, uh, which is really popular for the fashion industry, actually, because most of the Italian clothes are actually produced there. Uh, and what's quite interesting is that you have some really innovative uh, production companies which are there, but it's also a place where you have one of um, the biggest uh, Chinese population in Italy because there are so many Chinese factories implemented actually in Prato. Um, we wanted students to actually discover uh, the industrial area of Prato, so they could get an idea of what the fashion world looks like in Italy. Um, what's quite interesting is that all of them were uh, third-year students about to finish their bachelor, but they had no like they had never entered inside of a factory. That was like their really first time. Uh, we made them. Uh, we we created a partnership with uh, this uh, weaving house called Manteco, which is really famous uh, since uh, the as the post-war era. Uh, since after World War II, for actually uh, recycling uh, clothes uh, and at the beginning uniforms to create new wool. And they've kept these traditions uh, since then. And so the students got to discover uh, the, the factory and the whole process behind it. And then we asked them to um, collaborate collectively to create some huge fabric fresco uh, with uh, the different um, leftovers from Manteco. 
and these frescoes uh, were meant to express their vision of uh, their their week trip to uh, to um, to Prato. What was really cool is that uh, we were able to actually host the workshop um, before the exhibition, but also during the opening, and during the opening, uh, the, the students were working together to create also jackets, so uh, they they created some jackets with um, which would represent, again, like the sort of their vision of uh, the industry. And finally, I talk about the last project, uh, which is uh, one that we did at Citadium with the brand Adidas. And um, and basically, they uh, Adidas asked us to um, create a project around upcycling. And uh, so what we decided to do was to bring a team of workers on site, create a small factory, but also bring the audience to uh, invite the audience to um, create their dream bob or their dream fanny packs with leftovers from uh, closing leftovers from Adidas and uh, fabric desktop. Um, and what was really cool is that everyone uh, had the possibility to create a bob hat or fanny pack labeled Adidas, but of their own and which was totally free, but also discover kind of the beauty of upcycling by cutting by themselves the shapes and by choosing by themselves also the clothes they wanted. What was really funny is that uh, we had no idea that this workshop would be so successful. So what happened is that uh, we were there for two weeks. Uh, the first day there were quite a lot of people, but that was still manageable. And then Citadium made a story on TikTok, which had more than 200,000 views. And the next day we had like 240 people queuing up to create their fanny pack or bob. So it was a little bit insane as, as you can see on the first pictures here. There were a lot of people. <laughs> um, we, yeah, we absolutely, I think we learned a lot about this project and also about the new generation. Most of the the people were from the, f were from the Gen Z generation. They were between 14 and 16 years old. And what was really interesting is that most of the time we target them as, oh, these fashion victims, but actually they are really interested in upcycling and the secondhand market. And um, and it's funny how expressive they were also through their product. And I think we learned a lot from them as well during the experience. Um, so what's next? Uh, so at the moment, we we are looking actually to, to create an actual inclusive system. So um, as, you, as you saw, like those are like a lot of different experiments that we had, social experiment that we created with workers with different kind of public. And what we really want to do is actually to try to find out an inclusive system which could work on the local um, on the local scale, but also on a global scale. So this year we're actually gonna do a lot of research about about it and try to create a sort of thesis for us about it. And we'll travel in different regions in France um, to meet different kind of workers and study the problematic the problematics of local and uh, um, whether the, the are this, whether it's a strength a strength or a weakness of a local industry. But I think we need to be able to have this time of research uh, to be able to find out a natural system which can work and go further than just some artsy projects in some ways. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> yes. Um, so I see that you're wearing this. Yeah. <laughs> So the whole collection was available for sale. Um, so now it's been it's been since 2018 or 19, I think. So it's been a while. But yeah, the whole the whole collection was on sale uh, for sale on La Redoute, and that was really cool because it was labeled about the worker La Redoute and also the name of the workers. And I think it it was cool because the the workers were able to be as important as Yves Saint Laurent and Karl Lagerfeld and all those designers who've uh, came in the past with La Redoute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 
so it really depends of which collections. Um, let me give you some examples. So for example, the Shenzhen collections uh, was really uh, made for an art purpose as well. So there are only unique pieces. Uh, to be honest, like today, when we started about the worker, we were on a sort of B2C business, so business to consumer business, where we would produce clothes, uh, we would pay factories, we would produce clothes um, when uh, we had orders, basically. And as a young brand, you realize that it's really hard to actually sustain in a B2C business if you don't have 10K on Instagram. It's so sad, but that's the truth. And today, uh, what we do is that we collaborate more and more with brands uh, or cultural institutions. What's really cool about cultural institutions is that it gives us the freedom to go further in the closing and create true expressive kind of art piece in some way. Whereas when we collaborate with um, uh, fashion companies or product companies, um, it's more for a clientele. So we have to adapt to the clientele a bit more, which is the case, for example, of the Charentaise. Uh, at the moment, uh, yeah, we, we've created some quite commercial Charentaise as well, which detains, of course, the voices of the workers, but which are way more commercial than like what we would have done, for example, in Venice. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, I think that's the only one you can buy now. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So it's always volunteers. Um, for the first factory, it was a bit different. In the so the Saint Denis collection, it was a bit different because um, Modestim was helping the the, partici the participants to actually get a couture, uh, like a sort of couture certification, and so they thought that it was a good idea to have them, and they chose them to to uh, collaborate with us. But most of the time, we're on a um, on a volunteer basis sort of and uh, and what's uh, w what's important for us because we're only two is to have like a, f a group of uh, six people or sometimes we try to go further but it's hard because we're a small team as well so yeah Uh, it's really interesting because, um, so when I started about the worker, um, I had just finished an internship at Forensic Schooler in New York, and it was really the devil worst Prada in this company. And you get this kind of hierarchical manners, which is terrible. And at the beginning, to be honest, it was really hard to adapt and uh, be able to feel that, no, you're not the creative director, you're on the same level, you know? And I think what I've learned from the workers is to have this mutual respect um, and to treat everyone kind of on the same level as well. Um, and it was hard at the beginning because I think also, for example, fashion students, a lot of fashion students have this tendency to either uh, feel lower or feel higher and and it's it's a mentality that uh, needs to change I think um, in every company to be honest uh, and I think I've also learned not to stress out because what's uh, what's really interesting about uh, the uh, all this collaboration is that you never know what the outcome is going to be and most of the time the collaboration happen in a short period of time so yeah, when sometimes, for example, the Charentes collaboration happened in like 10 days or something like that, and we had no idea what would be the outcome. And yeah, it was a bit stressful, but we also enjoyed like the process of not knowing and uh, creating a design collectively. And that's the beauty of collective, the collective work is the fact that uh, you have this ability to make compromises, but also find the better ideas through through a, a collaborative work. Great. And, and Maria, on the back of that, I was wondering about your the role you take, because normally the designers are constructed as these mythical figures, these geniuses who single-handedly, you know, do the collections. Um, 
um, which of course isn't true, but, but I think your approach and your work in a way speaks of almost a lack of vanity on your part, because it's kind of self-effacing, because you're not really there, you're enabling. So I'm wondering how you view your role. My role, I'm just a facilitator. <laughs> I'm just someone who gives sort of some exercises, I think. Other than that, of course, I'm here to advise a little bit or like, uh, but, but the most important is for, personally, I think the most important is to um, sort of expose in the best way the work of the workers. So I would say that, yeah, I'm here to facilitate exercises and uh, discuss with the workers on certain design. But then I think my role at about the workers is especially to um, expose in the best way possible the pieces and showcase in the best way possible the process as well. Yes. So when COVID hit, it was a... Um, hmm. Like, it, it's funny because uh, actually during the COVID time, we had a really strange time where, of course, during the COVID period, when the COVID period happened, we couldn't really do any collaborations, to be honest. But at the same time, uh, we did some super short projects about masks. Uh, so there is this art gallery in uh, Berlin, which called me to do a mask collaboration with... Uh, um, with a, uh, a pattern maker in uh, in Berlin, but doing it on the phone. So it was like a three-day collaboration and where we just had a dialogue together. And then he, I, I asked him question. I was like, oh, okay, so choose your fabric. But it was, of course, harder to do it. But we did a so, sort of short collaboration um, where he produced, uh, I think, 500 masks, uh, but with his design and the fabric he had chosen. Uh, most of the fabric was fabric also uh, from his own home as well, which was interesting. But of course, it's limiting. But what was really funny is that uh, during the, the COVID period, of course, so we were super limited. But then as soon as uh, Paris reopened, uh, the Palais Tokyo called us and wanted a sort of workshop uh, for the young audience of the Palais Tokyo about mask again. And so um, we, uh, we produced, I think, 500 masks. And, uh, and then we had like fabric pens and everyone could actually draw their mask and express themselves on their mask and uh, leave the Palais Tokyo with their own uh, drawn mask in a way. Yes. I'm also wondering about the, the role reversals because what you're challenging is really the roles that we're given within the fashion industry, which are mostly passive roles and then some active roles for very few people. Um, and I wonder if, um, if these can yet be tightened parlous. So, for example, in your um, work, you work with models, even though the, the work is also models. Um, so why is it, for example, that you work with, with models and that it's not just work with modeling, but also in not in your um, not in your interventions, but in your other collaborations, the audience becomes a designer. Um, but you work with, with workers. Could it also be that the audience becomes a worker? So actually, okay, uh, let me talk about the, the two subjects. So, so the, for the photo shoot, I think, it's, uh, I think it's a habit to have models, unfortunately, for photo shoots. Uh, but I think it's also really nice that a worker can be model as a work, uh, uh, as a model too. And so it's nice to have this comparison within the work as well. Um, but also for the workers, it's super valuable to see that a model is wearing clothes. You know, it's like imagine, for example, you have a, a model who wear your clothes on a runway. It's it's really uh, like you feel really good about it because it feels like a finished product in some ways. And I think for the photo shoot, we, we always try to have a model to pose with the workers, but so you can kind of feel that they're on the same levels too as well. 
Um, about uh, the, 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 the workshop with the apron, uh, I think I, I expressed myself badly. Um, it was kind of a co-creation, so it's basically the public would come in with a drawing and a design, a design that they wanted, and then the workers would reinterpret it in his own way as well. So it's a co-creation between the public and the workers. Yeah. Did I answer to your question? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so we always try to keep in touch with the workers, for sure. So, for example, even the prisoners we worked with. Um, but sometimes it's also hard because of the distance. And also with COVID, it's super difficult. But sometimes we speak on WeChat or on Facebook, etc. To be honest, I wish that I was that I had a bigger team so we could actually continue to work with all of them and be able to give them the possibility also to... Uh, uh, to explore the fashion world differently and grow in the fashion world. And that's, I would say, one of our dream mission. But the reality is so much harder as well uh, because there are like only specific, like it's only a like specific case all the time. Uh, some of the workers uh, decide to have like uh, a regular job in their factory and they decide to stay. Um, but some actually comes up with um, some some uh, new ideas after the workshop. So for example, Fadila, who just got retired, has created her fashion uh, association where she helped women to learn how to sew as well. And that's now, she's like fully dedicated on it. And I, I find it really cool. Um, but it's really hard uh, to be able to actually have a longer impact after the collaboration. And I wish it was uh, other way, it, like it, uh, like I could do more, but it's difficult for sure. Um, but what we try to do is to keep in touch with most of them and try to involve them in new projects as well. So, for example, the um, the workers who collaborated with us for Adidas uh, were the one uh, that uh, were hired also for legal design. So the the project with the the blue apron. Uh, what we realize also is that uh, when the workers are younger, it's easier to have an impact on them because they rely more on what will happen in the future, for sure. Um, yeah, it, it's hard, and I wish I could do so much more, but it's just we need to grow to be able to do that. But that's a real problematic that we have, for sure. Mm. Exactly, and actually with Pulse and my associates, we're talking every day about creating a platform, either digital or not, where we could actually work with one worker by one and not only like go through factories to be able to do that. Uh, but that's a long process and that's that will take years before it be, it's going to be able to happen. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you see this becoming, like, as it grows, something that can be more involved in universities and such because so many fields in universities have core requirements like an ethics class or something you know and I think that this is such a thing that should be taught to you know fashion students because they are going to be the next generation in that world of fashion and I think this is necessary to discuss so do you see like a way you can start incorporating this into like fashion education as a requirement because I know right now I think we have fashion and sustainability, but I think ethics of fashion would be so important. Absolutely, and that's one of our goals too, is to be more and more involved with schools because I think there is a huge issue with the fashion education is that for years and still now, we're still on a system where you, like the fashion students and the fashion design students have to create a collection at the end of the year without really knowing the reason why. and. I think there are too many students who are trying to become the new Alexander McQueen or the new whatever designer. Um, 
And it's true, it's important, beauty is important, but there are so many other issues. And I think the huge issue about a lot of fashion students is that when they leave school, they don't know how the industry looks like. So when they want to become independent designer, it's extremely hard for them because they have no idea about how the system functions. Um, about like the commercial uh, the commercial aspect of the clothes or the production aspect of the clothes. And I think it's essential that the students get to work more also with uh, the different actors of the industry and definitely discover um, the production side. Uh, I know that there is a school in Amsterdam called Amphi where um, they are trying to build this kind of systems within their school, but um, it's really interesting, it's like, they do like audit, like audit work with uh, with students and different comp different production companies around the world. I, I just think like yeah, like uh, a lot of schools should do that and go way further, but also bring students to instead of creating collection, creating new system of creation in some ways. Yeah, but to answer to your question, yeah, it's absolutely an aspect that uh, we want to work on. It's really to. Um, be able to work more with the new generation of future makers in some ways.